Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lord. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen from the dead. Hey, good morning. I thought for sure we had more kids here. I think some of them have a little stage fright this morning. But we've been learning all about God's creation and how God created us and all things to glorify him. And so we have a fun little song that we are singing this morning, and then we're going to share our memory verse that we've been working on.
Well, good morning, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Hey, let me ask you a question. Do you have a story to tell? I bet you do. Well, today, you're in for it. You're in for three stories. I'm going to talk to you about three stories and how they connect to your life and my life and then what we can do with what we talk about according to God's Word. How's that sound? Pretty good? Well, you come on back in a few minutes and you'll find out. Take care and God bless. Thanks for tuning in. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all. Yeah.
whenever I get asked to do communion, one of the first things I always like to do is ask Harley, well, what, he's, what are you preaching on so I can kind of get focused uh, where I want to head. And he said, well, we're going to talk about faith, which is a pretty broad subject, but I've been thinking about that uh, this last week. So I had a couple of, of uh, thoughts that have really been in my mind the last, uh, the last week or so, um, thinking about you know, what direction I wanted to go. And one of them I probably couldn't get done in, in about five minutes, so I, I don't think we'll do that. But I do want to uh, go over to Romans chapter 4 and talk about Abraham real quick. So when Paul is writing uh, in Romans, he's trying to talk to the, the Jews uh, about why faith is so important and why their Jewish culture um, isn't maybe exactly what they think it should, have, should be and they are not the only ones, uh, the only chosen people. So when he's, when he's bringing up this argument of why um, God chose Abraham, he, uh, he brings to mind that it's not just uh, what Abraham uh, did. In fact, it really doesn't have anything to do with what Abraham did, but it was his belief in God that saved him. So let's read in, in Acts 4, uh, the first five verses. Oh, I forgot. My contacts changed this week, and I forgot. I don't have reading glasses yet, so I'm still trying to get this figured out. It's not funny. I'm getting old. <laughs> but then what shall we say that Abraham, our forefathers, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about. If he had something to boast about, but not before God, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, man, now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. You know, that's, I know it's written uh, to the Jews uh, in Rome at this time, but so much does this apply uh, to right now. You know, it's not by anything that we have done, by anything, how good we are, by uh, the decisions we made or how we've grown up, that's not what justifies uh, us. It's only by our faith, and it's uh, strictly from God. That's, that's what's given us our salvation, is our faith in God, as it, just as it was uh, to Abraham. It's not by what he did, but it was his faith in God that God gave him his righteousness. So as we come this morning uh, in communion uh, with God, let us remember that our salvation comes from Jesus um, alone and not by anything that we have done uh, or will do uh, or who we will be, but it comes directly from God. Let's thank him for that now. Father, we say thank you for sending Jesus. We say thank you for giving uh, us salvation, not by anything we've done, Father, because I will never be worthy of your salvation. Father, I say thank you for giving it to me anyway. Father, thank you for justifying me because of my faith. Father, we, we say thank you and, and we say that we do believe in who you are and who Jesus is. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to commune, commune with you this morning. I just pray these things to your son's name. Amen. do have extra available if anybody needs any. I want to continue there in Romans chapter 4 and verse 22. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. 
the words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone, but, for, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus the Lord from the dead. It was delivered over, he was delivered over to death, but our sins, uh, for our sins, and he was raised for life, raised to life for our justification. Again, Paul reminds us that it wasn't just written for the Jews at that time, but for future generations to come, that, that um, our faith is what justifies us. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you uh, again this morning, Father, help us to um, take time to remember uh, what you have done for us. Father, as we uh, drink this fruit of the vine that was Jesus' blood that was shed, Father, we, we say thank you for uh, the salvation that, that we have um, through you. Father, increase our faith each and every day. And we know that uh, our faith is what saved us. We, we want to continue to uh, remember you, whether it be this morning as we commune with you or tomorrow or in a week from now, Father, help us to remember that righteousness that was given to us from you. Father, thank you for sending Jesus as the Savior of the world. Praise these things through Jesus' name. Amen. offering basket in the foyer as he walked in as many of you uh, have seen and we're going to take time to pray over that offering and and the offerings uh, that you bring to us each and every week father accept the offerings that we've made uh, to you father help us to uh, use the funds uh, that have been offered here to your glory father help us to remember to it's not only uh, funds that we give but father we give ourselves each and every day Father, help us to uh, continue to, to give uh, to our fellow man, to our neighbors, whether it be through funds or through love. Father, help us continue to do that each and every day. Let's pray these things through Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, I'm glad you made it back. Did you think about your story or maybe a story that you have to tell? Well, let me tell you, I want to start off today with three stories that's happened to me in my life. I was much younger, but it happened to me in my life, and I want to share those with you and see if we can relate that back to some things that God talks about in His Word. I think we can. I love the, the, the scripture that we have on the screen here for you. The Lord says, I will instruct you, says the Lord, and guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch your progress. You know, God wants to direct you in your life. He wants you to know that in your stories, wherever they're at in life, that He's going to guide you. He's going to show you things. And He's watching us. He's, he's watching us to see how we progress in our spiritual walk with Him. I bet you're doing a good job. I bet you are. And I know God's proud of you, and I'm proud of you. Can we all do better? Of course we can. Well, let's find out through three stories today. Here they are. Story number one. Story number one. Here I am. I'm probably about nine years old, and my next-door neighbor asked me to do some work for him. Now, I thought this was going to be exciting and fun, and it was, actually, for two reasons. It was to paint the outside of a swimming pool. He thought that was something I could do, and two good things. He was going to allow me to go swimming anytime I wanted to, and secondly, he was going to pay me for the work. So everything is going great. I'm painting away, man. I'm like Michelangelo. Boy, I mean, it's looking great today until I hit that wasp nest. You got it. That wasp came out of there and landed and hit me right there. And I mean, I'm, oh, I'm crying and everything. I'm running home and crying to mommy, just like nine-year-olds do, I guess. So that was not a good day at all, let me tell you. Well, that weekend, my dad happened to be gone. And so... My mom says, you can sleep in my bed since you had a bad day. Well, that always makes a little nine-year-old feel much better, I guess. And so she reaches up in the closet. I'll never forget. She reaches up in the closet, and she pulls out this little blanket, and she flips it over on the bed on me. And when she did, no joke, another wasp flew out and hit me real close to the same spot. Now I really had a terrible, terrible day. Story number one. Story number two. My dad and I loved to fish and hunt together. Oh, we just, this was a good time with my dad. I mean, this is times I really, uh, I just love that time. Well, one day when we went fishing, again, I'm probably about that same age, nine or so. And on one side of the road, there's this big pond, and you can fish there. On the other side of the road is a bigger pond, but it had a sign, do not trespass. So I knew that. I knew what it said. I could read even back then. And so, of course, you know me, of course, uh, I decide that maybe the fish are better on that side. So I slip away from my dad. I crawl onto the fence. And I quickly found out why it said no trespassing, or at least one reason why. The embankment was almost straight up and down. And I slid down that little, and I would have went into the pond if it weren't for some brush, these, these bushes, if you will, that stopped my fall. But in the middle of that, one of the branches broke on the bush, and it shoved up my hand down into the meat part of the palm of my hand here, about two inches or so. Let me tell you, my friend, that was not a good day, especially when it was pulled out of my hand by the doctor. Third story. I'm a teenager, young, probably 12, 13, 13, maybe 13 years old or so. I step off the school bus where we're going from being transferred from one group of buses to another. And as I step off the bus, out of nowhere, a fist comes around and smacks me right in the nose. And I mean, I am dazed. And let me tell you, I did not have a good day. And really, the other kid didn't either, if you know what I'm saying. But nonetheless, those are my three stories. But what about you? And what about me, spiritually speaking? How do I make those connections? Well, let's try to do that. Number one, sometimes it's subtle. You're just doing fine and things are going great in your spiritual walk with God. Everything, you, you, and you relax a little bit. And you think you're kind of in control. And you've kind of relaxed in your spiritual walk because it's been pretty smooth in your life. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you get a sting, if you will. Yeah, you get jolted. 
You forget to study. You forget to pray. Uh, your attendance is not what it, what it should be. Your giving's gone down somewhat, whatever the case be. And, you know, no, I didn't read today. And no, I didn't pray today. And, and out of some nowhere, bam, you get hit. You weren't expecting it. But you take a hit. The second thing. Sometimes you read the sign. And you know exactly what the sign says. The sign says, do not enter. The sign says, keep out. You know beforehand that if you enter, you're going to have to pay a price. For some reason, you've come up with the thought that maybe I'll get lucky this time. Maybe nobody will notice. After all, everyone deserves to get wild once in a while, don't we? I mean, a vacation from Mr. Christian. A vacation for Mr. Christian doing good all the time. Once in a while isn't that bad, is it, Harley? I mean, you're not trying to do anything really bad. You're not trying to hurt anyone. And if you do everything just right, if you do it just right, maybe no one's going to know about it. You know the old saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas? Mm-hmm. Third story. In this area, you're taken by surprise. You had no idea it was coming. Because this time, it's not your sin. It's someone else's sin that comes along and hits you. It's the one that hits you hard in your walk as well. It jars you to the bone. You find you're suffering from the, fall, the fallout of someone else's sin. Because your sin affects me and my sin affects you. Oh, yes, it does because we're connected in the body of Christ. Yeah. Those things happen to us, don't they? And see, by telling you those three things, you probably saw one of those in your life or someone close to you, or maybe all three of those happen, has happened to you as well. They happen to all of us. And if you're around long enough, you, f you see the cycle. They kind of run, and there it is again, and oh, there it is again before you know it. So what is there that we can do? What is it that you and I can do to avoid that or at least calm that down a little bit to protect us? And I like that word protection because I believe God wants to protect His children. I believe God wants to protect you even from yourself. I believe He wants to protect you. So how can we relate that in God's Word? How can we help be protected? Let me give you three things. Number one, you must stay alert and be ready at all times. You have to stay alert and be ready at all times. There's a reason why Scripture tells us that God's Word is not given for us to simply read. It's given to us to apply to our lives for our protection and our safety. To guide us, He tells us. The Scripture says in 1 Peter, be alert and sober-minded. He's telling you, you have to be alert. Be alert of what? Because there's a devil out there, and he's going to try to sting you. That's what his business is. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour or to sting. I don't like getting stung, do you? I don't either. Satan loves to sting God's people and watch them suffer. And I believe he's doing a lot of stinging these days, and perhaps that's where you're at in your life right now. Watch out for the devil's schemes, he tells us. But this is why he tells us in, 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 in uh, Ephesians chapter 6 to put on the full armor of God. To, you can read the whole chapter there, or the whole part of that, that, that full armor. But he's telling us to layer ourselves up so that we have the protection from the enemy that's out there that wants to sting us in our lives. And they hurt. And so God says, if you layer up, it'll protect you in those things. If you were with us last week, but probably every week, we talk about faith and your faith and my faith. You have faith or you wouldn't have tuned in. You have faith in God and there's measures of faith and it goes up and down. It's like heartbeats in our life. But then over, if you look in Scripture in 2 Peter, he tells us that we have to add things to that. And he says, with your faith, I want you to add goodness and goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and perseverance, and godliness, and brotherly kindness. And if you have all these things wrapped up, or to protect you, all of these things will help you against the enemy's sting in life. 
Do you have those things in your life? Now, those things that are mentioned in 2 Peter that you see on the screen, those things that are mentioned, they're actually mentioned there as an investment. They're things that you can invest in. Invest in goodness and the knowledge and the self-control. When you invest those things into your life, they're not only a protection, but they're good for you because they give you a good return. They're a protection plan. They keep the sting of Satan away. Why do I say investment? Because I like that investment. I like to invest in something that gives me something in return that's good or better than. Don't you? Sure you do. You invest in a stock. You want a better return at the end of the year. I've been on both sides. I like the, I like the good return better than the negative side of things. But investment doesn't cost. It pays something when you study God's Word. What you invest in will return to you. Now watch this, and I want you to catch this one. It says, you cannot fulfill your destiny without applying the principles of investing in yourself and in God. You see, if you don't invest in God, you are not going to get a God return in your life. That's why God says, put this stuff on. That's why God says, study this word. That's why he says, stay alert in my word. If you know my word, it can give you protection. So when you invest in time with God... It's a protection plan in your life against the devil or the Satan's stings of life. Number two, choose wisely. Oh yeah, very important. God cannot and will not be mocked. I chose to crawl under the fence that day. I knew that it was not right for me to do that, but I chose to do that. Meaning that if you choose wrong, James chapter 4, you can see it there on the screen. And if you choose to do wrong and know that it's wrong, you will not only suffer the consequences of your actions, but you will also suffer the guilt process as well. I felt guilty after that because I got caught and I got hurt, but I also couldn't fish the rest of the day. But I felt guilty because I also applied that to my dad that day. Guilt, here's a good thing, watch. Guilt can be removed by and through repentance, but the consequences last a lifetime and can even leave scars in your life. You probably have scars. I know I do, of life, of things like that in my life. I still have a scar from that stick back when I was probably nine years old or so. It's a reminder of what I did, what I chose to do. I chose to do that. Oh, I got over the punishment of it. I got all past that part of it. But I still have the scar, and some of you have those scars, don't you? Choose wisely. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, you can see it on the screen. In Deuteronomy 28, I like this because there's a list there. And I can't list it all because the screen won't hold it all. I would just screen after screen after screen. And, and in Deuteronomy, it tells us that if we obey, we get blessings. If we disobey, we get curses. And there's a big difference there. Just read it. I mean, it's just pretty amazing. Obeying, blessings. Disobeying, curses. So which one's better? Obey? Of course. Because obeying brings blessings into my life. So we have to choose wisely. Choose wisely because you will do, or what you do will give you one or the other, the blessing or the curse. And that's just the way it is. You remember in the book, uh, or you remember when Joshua stood before the people and he said, you choose today who you're going to serve, but today, me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. What's he telling us there? He says, you choose what you follow. That's why it's an individual thing. He's saying it's your choice. And my friend, I want you to let you know that, yeah, you can choose to stay home. You can choose not to give. You can choose not to pray. You can choose not to read. But when you do something, you're blessed by it. But when you don't, uh, there's going to be a fallout, going to be some steep embankments that you might have to slide down to. You might get some scars. So you have to be careful about that. I love this, this uh, quote from John Mason. He said it this way, The height of man's potential, catch this, this is really good. The height of man's potential is in proportion to his surrender to what is right. Wow. 
I know that to be true in life. You see, what makes you tall in life is choosing to do right in the eyes of God. How are you doing with that? You see, I may be short in stature, and there's not much I can do about that, put some shoe lifts in maybe, but I may be short in stature, but I have a choice in how tall I stand in life. Choose wisely. All right, number three, the last one, discipline. We talked about that a few weeks ago as well, or at least we plugged it in for a bit, and it's still true today. Discipline is important in your life. Now, this in this area often is, is often, I should say, the most difficult area to deal with. And why do I say that? Well, parents struggle with this. Um, leaders of all kinds, of all areas of life struggle with this. Even leaders in the church struggle with this. But the truth is we all are faced with it in some time, at some point in our lives. Someone else sins. This is what happens. Someone else sins. And it affects you as a person or a corporation or a company or a family or a church. It just happens. Discipline is important in your life. It's, di it's important in your own life. It's important in, the, uh, in companies. It's important in the government. It's important even in the body of Christ, the church. But in the church, in the body of Christ, it's very important of how we deal with it. It is not to be ignored, as some might say, oh, don't worry about it. No, it's not to be ignored, because it's called sin. Sin always needs to be dealt with. But it always has to be done in such a way that it wins people back. It doesn't drive them away. It wins them back, but it's done gently. That's what Scripture tells us. Scripture tells us that we are to restore gently, Galatians chapter 6. Be kind and compassionate, loving and forgiving, and the list goes on and on, as you can see there. Sometimes, maybe too often, and I've seen this firsthand, we've been a little bit too harsh, a little bit too ugly. I often wonder how many have been left in the ditches of life saying, we did our job. Yeah. Sometimes we rush in and we condemn or even overreact, a knee-jerk reaction. I know this firsthand. When I was a young man, I, I discovered this. The church that Don and I went to when we were first married, the minister there was a wonderful man of God. John, John Abarzio was his name. Wonderful man. And this was before I knew really the calling of God in my life that he wanted me to preach. But this could have been one of those stepping stones or one of those things that revealed it to me. So we were on a Bible study together with this, this couple. Now this couple, they were married, but she had kids, he had kids, and they had kids, if you know what I mean. And so I was there in the Bible study. I really wasn't doing much of the. I was probably doing the study, and I wasn't working through the study. I was just learning under the, uh, the advice of this, this great preach, this wonderful man of God. And anyway, so he, they, they came to the decision to follow Christ, and and they accepted Christ and they were baptized and they were part of the, the church family and it, they were a beautiful, wonderful couple. But somebody in the church, not the minister, but somebody in the church got to them and told them that they were living in sin. That the only way that they could make this thing right was that they had to get divorced from each other and go back to their first spouse and if they were divorced, they're, if they were married, if they divorced and they got back together, then God would be okay with everything. And I'm like, it just blew my mind of how harsh and ugly it was. And it just absolutely crushed this couple. Sad. Listen, I, I understand what Scripture talks about. I understand the scripture says that God hates divorce and the why he hates it because it divides what he puts together. It tears things apart. But you cannot find in scripture that, that a divorce is the unforgivable sin. 
I'd be real careful with that. Real careful with that. However, there's also danger in not responding at all. There's danger in that. Of just letting things do whatever they want and not calling attention to what sin is. You see, one apple, one apple can spoil the whole bunch. I've seen it happen. And that's ugly too. So read 1 Corinthians. Just read the whole 1 Corinthians and just see. Take it for yourself. Just ask God. Say, God, let me read this and absorb what you want in my life. 1 Corinthians. Just read it. So what's the summary? You see it on the screen there. The summary is basically study God's Word and be alert. Secondly, if you know it's wrong, it will never be right. Stop it. Just don't do it. You see the sign. You can read. You already know what it says. Do not enter. <laughs> do not covet. Do not steal. Do not commit adultery. Huh? Lying, cheating, all those things. You already know what it is. So it'll never be right. So just stop it. And then the final one there is we all sin. Yes, we do. We all sin. And that includes, yes, even you, my friend. Be gentle. Be gentle in your correction of others. Be gentle. Oh, and you know those three stories I told you at the beginning? Well, let me tell you how they ended up. Because that's the good news for me. After the beasting that day and that evening, which was a bad day, my mom didn't only let me sleep in her bed, she crawled up into bed with me and she held me in her arms until I fell fast asleep, secure, a mother's love. I wish I had that again. One more day of that would be great. Well, when I fell and I got that stick stuck in my hand, my dad didn't cuss, my dad didn't yell, my dad didn't scream at me. His first reaction was, son, we got to get you to the doctor. Oh, and then after that, there was a punishment, rightfully so. And the third story, after the punch in the nose, <laughs> my mom and dad, they, they cared for me. But they also told me that I needed to evaluate those that I ran around with. Because you see, truly is, bad company corrupts good character. And it does. I want you to know today, 1 Peter chapter 5, you can read it there for yourself, but God wants to care for you today, my friend. He does. He wants to hold you when things happen to you. He said, I will never leave you even when you go through the stings of life or the hit in the face in life or even when you disobey or someone else does. If you're hurting today, He wants to get you help. He offers His Son to come to your rescue. He doesn't want to yell at you. He doesn't want to scream at you. He doesn't want to tell you all the wrong that you've done in your life. He just wants to welcome you home and tell you how much He loves you. And He does. My friend, no matter what your story is, and you have one, don't you? No matter what your story is, He's standing at the end of that story with open arms, with open arms, and a willingness to get you through. Now tell me, that's a good, good God, isn't it? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank You so much for loving me. Thank You so much for loving me enough to, to teach me in the stories of my life and then be able to find in Scripture Your Word, that how it directs and how it connects with my spiritual walk with you, Father. Help me to always see those things. That through the stories of my life, I can come back to Scripture and I can find how that you want to bless me, not curse me. So, Father, as we walk in this life with you, help us to stay alert, Father. Someone out there today just need to be reminded of that. They've gotten off just a little bit. They've gotten a little bit too relaxed. 
You know, they hadn't prayed enough, or it's not praying enough. It's not like we can pray enough, but, you know, they haven't been really spending time with you in some way or fashion. And I just pray, Father, today that they've seen that and they say, I'm sorry. I'm going to do better. Help us all to walk in obedience, Lord. We need that in our lives. A little closer to you with the blessings. We all love blessings, God. Help us to long to be obedient so that those blessings will still flow. And certainly, Father, when others sin, may we be truthful, but may we be gentle as well. Help us to not forget that because, oh, it may be someone today, but it may be me tomorrow that needs that gentle touch, that gentle reminder of what is going on and how I've strayed. So, Father, I ask your blessing on all those that have tuned in today. Would you give them that peace of knowing that you are there with open arms, ready to receive them today with the need that they have to help them get through. I ask this prayer in the name and the power of Jesus the Christ. Amen and amen. Thanks again, folks, for tuning in. I hope to see you soon. And God bless you. You have a wonderful week, okay? Bye-bye now.